So this was taken by um, a PhD student. And, and what this shows is the, this is the developing lymphatic plexus. And I'm going to tell you how this develops and the different cell types that contribute. Then I'm going to, the second part of the talk, I'm going to tell you how the lymphatics um, respond to injury and how potentially the lymphatic system might be a target for thinking about at least one aspect of the therapeutic um, repair of the heart we might be interested in. So the lymphatic system. So for, for those of you that don't know, it's a, a blind-ended network of vessels that pervade the entire body, including into organ systems. It's most well characterized in the context of the systemic lymphatic vasculature throughout the, 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 the main part of the body. And of course, it's been primarily linked with um, metastasis in cancer and this type of thing. But of course, it has physiological roles in homeostasis. So it's very important for regulating the tissue fluid balance throughout the body. So tissue fluid homeostasis, tissue fluid clearance, etc. Importantly, it surveys the immune system. This is an important point to take home because this will be developed later on when we talk about heart injury and the role of the immune system in that. And it's important for the absorption of dietary lipids and probably plays other roles which have not hitherto been uh, investigated. And of course, it has a, an impact in disease. So cancer metastasis, um, it's a route for um, tumor cells, primary tumor cells when they metastasize and migrate to secondary sites. And of course, evidence of tumor cells in the lymph nodes is a, is a very poor prognostic marker for those people suffering from cancer. And we, there are various forms of lymphedema by which the lymphatic vessels swell at the collecting vessel end, and that can cause a very dis quite a painful condition um, when the lymphatic system is de defective. And then there are in instances where you see hydrops uh, fetalis. Down syndrome is a very good example of this, and the thickening on the neck and the fluid accumulation on the neck of the developing fetus is an indication of that. And then, of course, uh, there are various other uh, lymphangioma, et cetera, and lymphangiosarcomas, which are cancer-related um, conditions affecting the lymphatic system. So it has a, a known physiological role and then has been implicated in disease. Um, one of my colleagues uh, disparagingly referred to it as the body sewerage system, which I thought was a bit unkind, but I thought on the back of that, I would show you what a sewage system properly looks like. This is the Victorian sewage system in London. It, the lymphatics, I'm, I'm pleased, this is River Thames, you can you probably make this out from the, but that, that luckily the lymphatic system is much better organized than this, so as, as you will see. So um, one of the interesting, so I'm not going to tell you, it's a very convoluted story how we ended up working in the lymphatic system. In a very summarized version, we were interested in, in genes that affect transcription factors that affect heart development. And one such transcription factor that, that, that came around to the lab was a transcription factor called PROX1, which is a, an ortholog of, of, of Prospero in Drosophila, and it has a, a very fundamental role in defining lymphatic endothelial cell fate. That's its role as known as been very well described. So it's a critical master regulator of whether an endothelial progenitor cell goes down a route of a lymphatic endothelial cell or a blood endothelial cell. But we were interested in it, it because people provided us with some hearts from the knockout mice. And actually, they had a cardiac defect that was related to muscle ultrastructure. And we went on to describe that and published a paper on that. And then we also looked at its role in maintaining the adult cardiac conduction system. So we were doing everything but lymphatics, which was the role it's best described for. And it suddenly occurred to me, here we have these tools and these mouse models that actually are useful for looking at PROX1 function. Maybe we ought to have a look at the cardiac lymphatic system and see if that is affected in development or even in adult stages. And then as I looked through the literature, it became clear that there's very little known on the lymphatic system in the heart. And in fact, that's echoed here. So, so Bob Anderson is, is a British Heart Foundation professor who uh, I worked alongside when I was at UCL, the Institute of Child Health. He's now retired, but still very active, going to, does a lot of teaching. Um, he knows what he doesn't know about cardiac anatomy is probably not worth writing about. But he wrote this review, and in there he noted that the information specific to the cardiac lymphatics is scarce. Indeed, quite often the topic is not even mentioned in many medical textbooks, and I think this is still true today. But there again, as ever, if you then trawl back through historical studies, there's always some very um, eminent uh, anatomist who's actually described this very nicely already, at least in, um, in this case in these um, nice, very nice drawings. And this is a guy called Patek, so back in 1939, described the morphology of the lymphatics of the mammalian heart, and this is the dog heart. 
And actually, when we compare his drawings, which are the dark is the lymphatics, and then stipled here is the coronary vasculature, and you can see it's interwoven and close relationship between the two. If we look at one of our immunostains, you can see something similar. So here's lymphatics characterized by these blind end collecting ducts. And here's, the, and here's a coronary um, vein here. And you can see the very close interwoven proximity. And this is just a, a nice indication of what previously was very well described back in the, um, uh, 1939. So the story I'm going to tell you about was really carried out by three people. It was started by Linda Klotz, who was a Wellcome Trust PhD student. This is why we were at the Institute of Child Health in London. It was then picked up by Sophie Norman, who's a British Heart Foundation PhD student, taken into Oxford. And Joachim Vieira is a postdoc who kind of helped out both in, in, along the way. So the first thing we had to do was go back into development and work out, well, well how do the lymphatics form? We have no idea really how they form and, and what the stages and the development and the growth of the lymphatic system is. So what I'm showing here is some whole mount immunostaining, and, and in all honesty, this transformed the project. Initially, we started out looking at histological, histological sections where we would see a few cells marked by some markers. I should say that most of the markers that were, were suggested to be lymphatic-specific were not in our hands. We found they crossed over with different cell types, so we had to be very careful about characterizing that. But being able to do this whole mount, and this is immunohistochemistry, but we also developed nice whole mount staining for immunofluorescence, this really transformed the way we could look at this because the lymphatic system forms very superficially across the kind of outer layers of the heart, which is why it intersperses with the coronary veins, and I'll show an image of that later on. It actually starts before this stage, so 12 and a half in the mouse. You see the first evidence uh, on actually on, on the ventral surface, but then it starts to expand on the dorsal surface where it's more readily visible um, by day 14 and a half. And here now we move to ventral, and you can see this expansion. Here's a coronary vein that isn't labeled, particularly by this staining. And you can see it um, developing through to P15. Here's some close-ups of the plexus. So with the growth of the heart, the plexus remodels, expands, and it expands down to the base of the heart quite readily. And if you look here, this is now a marker, which is PROX1. So this is the master regulator of lymphatic endothelial cell fate. You can see how this plexus forms from this what the outflow region, the, the sort of great artery region down towards the base, and you can see these cells nicely mapped out here. And here again is a, a, a one of the veins that it's tracking. If you look by immunofluorescence, and really we looked quite carefully at this because the dogma of cardiac lymphatic, or sorry, lymphatics in general, is that lymphatics are derived from veins. So they li the systemic lymphatic vasculature in embryology terms is derived from the cardinal vein. And we were then curious to know whether the lymphatics in the heart were budding off from the coronary veins and perhaps in a similar way to ha as happens in the embryo. And what we did was we just tracked very carefully. There's no lineage tracing here. This is simply by immunofluorescence, looking at the expansion and growth of the lymphatics marked here by PROX1. And this is eomucin, which marks the coronary veins. And whilst they're in close proximity, and you can see them tracking down, etc. There's no evidence of any budding off or derivation from the coronary veins. So the lymphatic um, vessels come from somewhere different than, the, than a straightforward um, coronary vein origin. So one of the things we observed, if you go look early on in development, you can see these PROX1 positive cells. These are migrating through the outflow region. So they're from an extra cardiac source. They're coming from outside of the heart migrating in through this outflow tract region. And I haven't shown you the picture here, but we have uh, images of, from the embryo proper, these cells sort of migrating through from regions that are actually in the mesoderm, but also aligning with um, where the somites are forming. So these extra cardiac cells coming in and contributing to this process of um, early lymphangiogenesis. Now, one of the questions then was if they're not budding from cardiac veins and they're coming from an extra cardiac source, are they coming from a venous source elsewhere in the embryo? And therefore, might we be able to lineage trace that using classical lineage tracing techniques? So here we're using a Thai 2 Cree with a Rosa 26 TD tomato, and Live 1 is a marker of the lymphatics. Um, I should say that we confirmed all of this lineage tracing in multiple animals to, and multiple venous markers. So this is a PDGFB Korean. This is inducible. 
We use more than one reporter because there's very well documented evidence that different reporters have different efficiency of recombination and actually lighting up the target cells of interest. And also you need to use more than one Cree to be confident that you're marking with, a, with reasonable efficiency and, and the cell type and with specificity. What we realize quite quickly is if you look at this picture again, this is a whole mount and this is 18 and a half, so this is just before birth as the lymphatics is quite well formed. If you home in on some of these regions, you can immediately see that whilst there are clear evidence of tomato positive cells, in this case the nuclei surrounded by live one positive staining, there are also examples of live one where there's no tomato and likewise up here you can see evidence of that throughout this plexus. Now you could just say well that's efficiency of the Cree, it's not labeling every cell and so on, but that's why we did all these experiments to sort of back that up. And what this told us was that yes, there is a venous contribution, or at least a TIE 2 lineage, or a PGFB lineage contribution, which you would say was veins, but there's also a mixed contribution. So another source is actually contributing to these um, cardiac lymphatics. And of course, this is another extra cardiac source. So that was curious, because this is now going against the dogma that says that all lymphatics are venous derived. They're not. And clearly in the heart, they certainly aren't. And I'll show you some other studies very briefly that suggest that's also true of other organ systems. So organ-based lymphatics are quite different. So we went to look for different sources that these cells might be, and we tried a whole bunch of different lineages. So up here, this WT1 is a marker for the um, epicardium during development, and the WT1 Cree with a, uh, a rosa EYFP, and we didn't find any labeling. The same was true of MES1 Cree, which is the early cardiac um, pre-cardiac mesoderm, so developing the lateral plate mesoderm that contributes to cardiac progenitors very early on in heart development. These also did not contribute to the lymphatics. NKX 2.5, CRE, so this is now a little bit late, later on in the stage of specification of cardiac mesoderm and cardiac progenitors. This also didn't contribute. And WINT1, so this is looking at a neural crest contribution. Again, we saw no evidence of contribution, so we ruled out epicardium, Precardiac mesoderm, cardiac progenitors, and neural crests. And none of these contributed to the lymphatics. So the next question well, well, what is the main, or what is a potential source that is non venous for these, um, this developing lymphatic plexus? And we honed in on the hemogenic endothelium. And the, and the reason for this was, was, was relatively clear because this population, which actually um, is attributed to the developing yolk sac but also the aorta gonad mesonephros region. And then in the more definitive um, hemogenic endothelium and the hematopoietic source, of course, the primordial liver. But these can give rise to both blood and also endothelial cells. So blood endothelial cells. So we figured that they've been looked at in the context of being a progenitor population that may give rise to more than one cell type, particularly in the hematopoietic lineage. But also there's a possibility then if they can give rise to this uh, population, there may be a contribution to lymphatic endothelial cells, so lymphatic endothelial progenitors, which is quite a novel idea, but not out of keeping with the contribution to the blood endothelium. So we had to then get tooled up, if you like, to, 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 to analyze this carefully. And there is no single Cree mouse that, does the, that labels the hemogenic endothelium A specifically or be particularly effectively. So we had to do a combination to, to, to home in on this. So we use this VAV1 Cree, and this, is also, this has been used in uh, mutagenesis studies in hematopoietic and endothelial cell lineages. So this is a reasonable marker, but it also marks other cell types. PDGF receptor B to Cree. Whilst this is platelet derived growth factor, this is expressed heavily in the developing um, hemogenic endothelium. And this inducible FIMS or CSF1R Cree which uh, labels tissue resident macrophages, but, all, but these derive from yolk sac derived erythromyeloid progenitors, so derived from the hemogenic endothelium. So already this is a clue that other cell types can come from this population, suggesting it's multipotent. So we have to take all three of these into our studies. And if I just show you the VAV1 Cre to begin with, here's the developing plexus. What we've done here is, is done a multiple staining. So we have the reporter driven by the Cree. PROX1 and LIVE1 to really pinpoint down. And what you can see here is examples where we've got co-labeling of all, of all um, four marks. 
and that's shown by this orthogonal view taken through these selected regions, one, two, three, four. And then five and six are examples where we don't see co-staining, for example, at prox one. So I think that when you do these, these immunofluorescent studies, the orthogonal view and the Z-stack view where you show definitive labeling in a single cell is really important. And, and just to highlight that some of the co-labeling is shown here, also to point out these cells here, which are live one positive and also positive for the VAV1 tomato combination, these are the tissue resident macrophages. It's another story what these are doing in the heart. That's also something we've been quite interested in. And then if you look at the other two careers supporting evidence, the same applies. So we, here we've only looked at a couple of markers, the, the PROX1 and then the PDGF receptor B to CRE, driving this R26, RYFP, so basically a YFP, GFP stain. And we can show examples where there's clear co-labeling and then equally examples where there isn't. So again, this heterogeneity of the, of the lineage. And likewise for this inducible FIMS or the inducible CSF1R, Again, examples where we've got clear labeling and then where we haven't, where we lose one of our markers, in this case, the PROX1. You can see a PROX1 positive cell next door, but not in the Z-stack orthogonal plane. So we have to be very careful about assigning this. There's a lot of skepticism around the different Cree lineage tracing, and I think it's warranted. But if you do it in multitude and you do it with careful Z-stack imaging, you can pin down the lineage. And then one other experiment that we, we threw into the mix was to, set, to take yolk sac explants from early embryos, in this case um, day eight, and put these into a culture system whereby we then add um, a, a developmental growth factor known to invoke lymphangiogenesis, so a, a, a stimulus that exists in the embryo to promote lymphangiogenesis, and see if we could turn some of these cells into becoming PROX1 positive. And again, this was clearly evident. There's examples here in these cultures of cells that label up with all three when you do this experiment. So the VEGFC is um, sufficient to drive a, a sort of lymphatic endothelial cell program in this uh, naive yolk sac, which again is the source of the hemogenic endothelium. So a set of experiments to try and um, also confirm that uh, we are indeed dealing with mixed lineages, was to target key genes in the different lineages. So I've already talked about PROX1, PROX1 as being essential for specifying lymphatic endothelial cell fate. So here we, we got these PROX1 GFP mice. So here these are po positive with, for GFP when targeted by virtue of excising the um, PROX1 um, um, cDNA, but also by taking out this LOXP site and then bringing the EGFP in frame. So this is quite a nice tool for reporting targeting, but also for taking out PROX1. And when we crossed it with the TI2 CRE, we then had a look downstream, and first of all, confirming that we are taking it out in the heterozygous situation, and that also, interestingly, PROX1 being quite upstream in the pathway for lymphatic endothelial cell genes, that genes such as VEGFR3 and LIVE1, which are downstream markers, are also um, significantly downregulated, suggesting that this targeting had worked. When you look at the embryos or that the, the manifest from this, uh, these mutants, you can see quite late stage. So these are controls shown here, and they've got the nice vasculature. And we're just looking in the head vasculature here. But here you can see hemorrhaging and evidence of, of hemorrhaging. Now, the question of whether it's, it is hemorrhaging blood vessels or whether it's actually blood-filled lymphatics is something we haven't actually worked out yet. But you can see that no, no, either way, this um, vasculature is abnormal. When we look in the hearts of these uh, mutants, we, we see here's the um, control situation where you've got this developing plexus moving down from, from base to the apex of the heart. And we can see here, depending on the severity, we see some rudimentary uh, evidence of the lymphatics. And, and we can actually see ev evidence where it's completely uh, ablated. And what we observed is that if you look very carefully, you can see targeting of these in a more mild form. And it goes down to basically loss of the entire plexus. Now, the implication for the heart when that happens is not entirely drastic. So what you see is dysmorphic hearts. So these hearts are smaller, growth retarded, and a little bit dysmorphic. But it's not the case that they, the animal, for example, that it's a lethality. So these hearts generally recover, 
Um, and indeed, what we could observe was a sort of fairly mild loss of some of these cells through apoptosis, as we can see here. So this is caspase 3 staining at the sprouting ends of these lymphatic um, endothelial cells. So this is targeting PROX1 to the venous-derived lineage. And actually, depending on the degree of targeting, there's full recovery of these animals. So we see type 2 Cree mutants moving all the way through into uh, postnatal stages with a very robust lymphatic endothelial cell response. One interesting observation we made was that um, in some of these uh, mutants, we could see uh, some degree of uh, development of the, of the lymphatic plexus, as shown here. So this is the wild-type version, and this is the, or the control version, and this is the, the mutant. And what we've got is a truncated uh, truncation to the plexus as we move from a, um, base to apex. This was interesting because this suggested a slightly different role, a later role for PROX1, which had not hitherto been described. So as well as defining specification of lymphatic endothelial cell fate, what we're showing here then is that if you remove PROX1 to a certain degree and not, so it's a hypermorphic event, we can actually see um, a remodeling defect. So what we've um, done here is use this angio tool literally to map some criteria of this developing plexus. And what we can see is there, in terms of vessel length, this is markedly reduced. The total number of endpoints to show the degree of remodeling, this is um, actually elevated, which is interesting because that shows a sort of a dysmorphic um, plexus, but the vessel diameter so is much thinner. So basically, what we're, what we're looking at then are shorter vessels, but many more of them, and much thinner, so it's not remodeling properly. So this is a late remodeling um, phenotype and, and, and function for PROX1 that hadn't hitherto been appreciated. And interestingly, if you look in a different lineage, so in these type 2 PROX1 mutants, it's not just driven to the heart, the skin is another organ system. And you can see here, just as a control, this is the, the control situation in the skin, a skin preparation. These are lymphatics just shown here. And then this is in the mutant. And you can see, again, these are thinner vessels. And there's a, and there's a remodeling defect here, although it's fairly mild. So in the skin, it's not too drastically affected. Lymphatics do form, which suggests that there may be another contribution, again, in the skin. But it's actually the remodeling defect and the thinning of the vessels, which suggests they're perhaps not as, as functional. The next, of course, we then tried to take out PROX1 in the VAV1 lineage. So this is now in the hemogenic endothelium to see what effect we could observe with that. And of course, we didn't really see a huge contribution of hemogenic endothelium. We would say the split was around about 80% venous-derived and maybe 20% hemogenic endothelium. So we weren't expecting a, a huge phenotype, particularly given what we'd already observed in the context of the venous um, source. So these animals look grossly normal. But what we could see, where we can see evidence of targeting, and this is where we had to f home in very carefully on regions of the plexus where we've got targeting by virtue of the GFP and the VAV1 lineage, and we've also can clearly see loss of some of these cells, and they're not switching on markers of LIV1. So I think that's uh, reasonable proof that we've targeted some of these cells. They're not becoming lymphatic endothelial cells, and we've lost them from the developing plexus. You can see evidence of gaps here highlighted. So targeting, but no switching on of LIV1. And actually, some of these cells here, are, you can see as shadows in this LIV1 staining. So clearly, we are removing and targeting these cells via the VAV1 Cre uh, as evidence that, that, that this VAV1 Cre does mark the lineage contributing to uh, lymphatics. So I'm just going to summarize the development section because we'll move into the repair um, relatively quickly. So the lymphatic vessels of the heart, they first emerge at day 12 and a half on this ventral side and then continue to expand and develop net down with an align with the coronary veins. So with growth of the heart, you get a significant expansion of the network. There's a very close anatomical relationship between the coronary vessels, but they do not sprout from those, so they're not an origin. And they're comprised of both venous and non-venous contributions of LECs. And we think that the hemogenic endothelium is the non-venous source, or at least one of the non-venous sources, based on combined lineage tracing. And if you target PROX1, the master regulator of LEC fate in both TIE2 and VAV1 lineages, this does confirm a dual origin, albeit that the phenotype is not overly severe. And PROX1 can play a later role in remodeling of the cardiac lymphatic plexus, which again was hitherto not previously appreciated. So what this did, this study was first of all demonstrated 
a, a sort of developmental study and a time course through that developing heart, but also challenged the dogma that all lymphatics are venous derived, which is probably why the finding was reasonable impact, because this has been put down in textbooks as completely, completely black and white, and suggests that the difference in the ontology of the systemic versus organ-based lymphatic system may exist. So there may be differences both in the, in the, in the development, the origin, and perhaps even in the, the relative function of the different uh, origins. And we weren't the only ones that were thinking this in different systems. So as I mentioned before, um, in the heart, we, we demonstrated this. Um, this was a paper that came out uh, actually the same, same year. So this is all published last year uh, in the brain. There is a different um, origin in the brain that's not just a venous derived. The dermal, so I've already shown you a section um, in the PROX1 mutants through the skin suggesting that it's not all venous derived because when we target PROX1 there, there's not a, uh, a complete loss. And Tyre Mackinnon's group showed that, it, the, again, the, the skin lymphatic vasculature is not just venous derived. And then a hemogenic source contributing to the mesenteric lymphatic vessels. So again, another lymphatic vessel bed, um, which has a different source. And interestingly, in the zebrafish, um, Karina Yanev, who originally with Brandt Weinstein demonstrated very nicely that in um, the developing zebrafish that all of the lymphatic endothelial cells appeared to come from sprouting from veins and tracking down. Actually, she's since gone on to show in her, with her own group that there is a significant pop contribution from this angioblast population, which we would say is analogous to the um, hemogenic endothelium. So there's a, a mounting evidence for this um, different sources and mixed origin and heterogeneity of the lymphatic vessels, at least in organs. So as I said, we, we try and work out from studying development, in this case the development of the cardiac lymphatics, what that might mean for the adult heart in terms of repair and, and, and so on. So we've been very keen, and most of our work in this area has been on, on the epicardium, but as I'm going to show you, the lymphatics has proven to be very interesting. So the first thing to say is when you give a myocardial infarction to a, a mouse, one of the things that we see is that the um, lymphatic gene program is, is, is upregulated. So even if you look here, this is just a protein uh, western blot for VEGFR3, one of the key markers in the receptor for VEGFC, you see a significant upregulation. And this is shown here um, by 24 hours in day two and day four, and then moving right through and a drop off by day 21. And that's indicated here from the scanning densitometry. And if you track that, but there's real time here down on the bottom, so just looking at uh, gene expression, VEGFR3, LIVE1, and PROX1. You have to slightly ignore this because PROX1 is also expressed in the myocardium, so we've had to comp um, compensate for the myocardial expression. So this is the lymphatic expression from sorted cells. So VEGFR3 goes up quite dramatically up to day four. Um, live 1 follows that, so in, in sync, so VEGFR3 is upstream of Live 1, and PROX1 um, begins to elevate from day 2 up, but is most significant around these later stages as well, but it's initially expressed at high level early on as well. So the developmental program is switched on. These are all developmental genes that ordinarily aren't on at high levels in the adult heart. And this is the effect if you just look at whole mount, and this is the chemistry of what the heart looks like after an MI. So this is seven days after a, a mouse has been given a myocardial infarction. Here's the control situation, and you can see we've stained here. VEGFR3 stains very nicely in this adult heart by immunohistochemistry. You can see the, the, the plexus has formed here. This is what we see in the injury situation. Here's the infarct region here. And you can see this lovely sprouting of these um, lymph vessels. So it's quite a significant effect. If we do sections and have a look more carefully at what happens with injury, you can see here no MI. So we have, obviously, we can pick up some podoplanin, live one. So this is stain in lymphatics in section. By day seven, you can see this is hugely upregulated in the superficial regions of the heart. So this is just below the surface of the epicardium and subepicardial regions and also in the underlying myocardium. And as we move through to day 35, so sort of five weeks on beyond the injury, you can see we start to develop these huge shunts, which are very significant in terms of the potential to clear fluid and, 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 and other things from the site of injury. But this is what happens under normal circumstances in the mouse. So one of the things we were then interested in was clearly the mouse has, a, has an issue thinking about um, 
you know, its response to MI, just like all adult mammals has, it has a default wound healing fibrosis response, it remodels, it can undergo heart failure and all of the usual um, events, it's not very regenerative. So what would be the case if we, if we overstimulated this lymphatic response, if we gave back something that might promote this, uh, what might the effect on the heart be, given it's a naturally occurring compensatory response at seven days? So, of course, we then look back in development, and this just shows you how the classical model of how lymphatics are supposed to form from the cardinal vein. But the key point to take home is that VEGFC from surrounding mesoderm is a key source of the growth factor that stimulates the sprouting of these lymphatic vessels. So VEGFC was our uh, molecule of choice to add to these hearts um, after injury. We had to be very careful because VEGFC can signal both through VEGFR2 and VEGFR3, and if it signals through VEGFR2, it will also have an effect on the coronary blood vessels. So this is the blood vasculature signaling pathway. So we had to take a mutated version, this VEGFC cis156 serine, and this signals exclusively through VEGFR3, should in, in theory only affect the lymphatic vessels. And what we're expecting here then are potentially two different effects based on what we know the lymphatics do systemically. What we're, effect, what we're expecting to see is, uh, is, is an evidence of perhaps reduced edema or a, a, an effect on tissue fluid that accumulates after infarction through the injury, um, which is thought to occur because of damage to the lymphatics, but also through other means. And we're also expecting to see a potential modulation of inflammation because of the role of immune surveillance and trafficking of immune cells that the lymphatic system is reported to have. We would expect if we're invoking um, lymphangiogenesis or increased vessel permeability, we would be able to take up immune cells and clear them from the injured heart. So this, this was a very blunt experiment because we didn't know when the right time to give this was and we had no idea what we were doing by, by administering it. But I'm just going to show you the effects of that and then a little bit downstream of that, some work that we've been doing to try and identify what the mechanism might be. So, we're so an early effect perhaps increased the permeability because VEGFC would be expected to do that in prior to a lymphangiogenic response, it would open up the lymphatic endothelium. That may well help in terms of tissue fluid uptake, for example, and immune cell uptake with the actual sprouting. So when we gave VEGFC to these animals, and we gave it uh, a recombinant uh, human form of this mutated VEGFC by IP injection, 0.1 micrograms per gram, days 0, 2, 3, 4, and 6. So a reasonable number of injections just to make sure that we were going to have an effect over quite a, lo a, a long window of time. And then we would look at day seven post-MI. And we did it in these animals, which are VEGFR3 LACZ reporters. So these are going to report lymph lymphatic development or angiogenesis. And you can see here, this is an example where we haven't got any VEGFC. And this is an example where we have. I think the whole mount alone shows we've got quite a pronounced response. But if you go down to here where we've magnified the pictures, this is where the suture is. You can still see it's quite evident. You can see the blanched area of, um, of, of infarct round. And you can see very clearly that the response to VEGFC treatment is huge and much more significant in these hearts. So what's the consequences for the heart? Well, quite striking, really. Um, and as striking as I've seen for any of these interventions we've tended to do. So when we've stimulated epicardium, for example, towards potential heart repair, we've never seen anything quite as striking as this. So first of all, the infarct size was significantly reduced. And given that that is an event that's established relatively early, this may well reflect <coughs> a reduction of the edema. But we don't know. Later effects perhaps are modulation of the immune response by the time lymphangiogenesis is fully underway. And of course, we've shown that by day seven. So if you take here remodeling events such as um, changes in end systolic volume, again, these are uh, significantly reduced. And the ejection fraction as the sort of surrogate marker of cardiac function is increased and increased by quite some sizable margin. There's at least a 50% increase in this ejection fraction from day seven to day 21. So this is after the lymphangiogenic response that we've noted. And if you just look at some examples by MRI, and we looked at many examples, you can see these hearts are doing much better with the VEGFC. You can see this um, volume changes in the chambers are much more significant. The wall, the wall thickness is improved relative to the untreated. And here's some stills just to highlight that. So the whole idea about 
clearing inflammation and, and inflammation in, in injury, of course, is a double-edged sword. So particularly with respect to, to, to lymphatics. So we know that some inflammation is good, chronic persistent inflammation is not so good, and we know that we, we, inflammation is required for clearing the dead and dying debris after injury, but it's also um, required for wound healing and fibrosis and scarring downstream. In the context of lymphatics, we also know that the immune cells themselves can produce the growth factors such as VEGFC that give rise to new sprouting. So the, the, the actual incoming um, um, monocyte macrophages, and in particular macrophages, actually produce a VEGFC to invoke lymphangiogenesis, which then actually, of course, clear the cells. The consequences of clearing that early, uh, or changing the clearance dynamic, is, is something that we're, we're now working on. And this has been described, this process of, of incoming in immune cells actually triggering lymphangiogenesis in skin and respiratory tract, inflammation, bowel di disease, diabetes, but there's been no mention in the heart. There's a precedent for in increasing um, lymphangiogenesis in other injury models that has definitely left to a, le le um, led to a clear um, increase in the resolution of inflammation and a better outcome. And that here, this K14 VEGFC is expressing VEGFC as a transgenic mouse in the skin. And then if you do a skin, wound, uh, skin wounding assay, and look for the resolution of the inflammation of the series of assays done here by this group published in blood several years ago now, you get an increased resolution of, of, of these cells and you have a better outcome in terms of uh, wound healing. And just to finish, I've mentioned the people already that Sophie, um, Joachim and Linda who did the bulk of the work, um, Tom is working on um, really characterizing the basic in immune response, the inflammatory cell infiltration, the timing of that, and he's doing that for other reasons. He's also involved in a collaboration with, with um, Maurer's group on the part of the Leduc, and then various others that have helped along the way, and, and mouse models. Carolyn helped us with the MRI, and we're funded by a variety of people, but so I should really acknowledge the British Heart Foundation and the Wellcome Trust for this particular project. And thanks for your attention.